Today we're lucky enough to be joined by John McDonnell. Uh, for those who don't know, he is the ex-Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, member of the Labour Party, uh, and has been the Member of Parliament for Hayes and Howington since 97. Thank you for joining us, John. Great. Um, so yes, the first question should be, um, had Labour won the, uh, the last election, you would have been you would have been the man tasked with, uh, I suppose, finessing the financial side of her uh, basic income mm. pilots. So do you have a preference? Do you have a, a basic income preference? Well, I, I was trying to um, ensure that we built up the argument for basic income over time. And the reason for that is because there's quite a lot of scepticism about whether or not it would work in our sort of society and economy. I, I'm convinced it can, um, but the reason um, I, I wanted to ensure that we ran a few pilots within the UK was to enable us to convince people more broadly that it could succeed. I worked with Guy Standing um, from was just 2015, 2016, and in the 2017 and 2019 Labour Party manifestos, we included a commitment to a pilot, uh, a number of pilots across the country. And we had lined up, in fact, we had quite a large number of individual towns or cities who were saying we were keen to launch a pilot in that particular area. So places like Sheffield and Liverpool. And what we wanted to do is engage in a process whereby we would design that pilot based upon, to a certain extent, local needs, and then use, the, in some instances, actually use different pilots to see what um, was the most effective way of well, giving people the freedom from poverty, first of all, but also giving people a basic income that would provide them with a quality of life and the security that would then benefit the whole economy. So that's the stage I, I was at. Mm -hmm. I was pretty agnostic on the range of views about the nature of the, the pilots that we should undertake. Um, and in some instances, if necessary, argue maybe around a, a minimum basic income that we could then roll out over a period of the lifetime of a Labour government, so a, a five year period. Um, I think in that way, we would overcome some of the scepticism that there was about basic income. Well, yeah, on that note, do you think that, um, I mean, since, the, since this has all come about, um, the pandemic furlough has served as a kind of extensive quasi-basic income, essentially, I suppose. So do you think that people are becoming more, well, in, in, increasingly receptive to the, to the idea of basic income and realise that it's not really, it doesn't really belong to a, uh, uh, the left or the right? When we first raised basic income, and I can, I can remember doing a number of meetings and it being raised in Parliament and elsewhere. The media response was incredibly hostile. It was seen as um, fantastical, um, mm. uh, utopian in many respects. What's interesting, I think what's absolutely fascinating, is that over the last year, but um, and it was before COVID, but actually as COVID pandemic hit, it's becoming increasingly in common discussions around where we go from here, not just to deal with the immediate issues and problems that people face because of COVID, but also the sort of the, how it could be an essential ingredient of the sort of society that we want to create post COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, on the, the, it's interesting you refer to the furlough scheme. Um, when I was Shadow Chancellor in the last month or so, I, of my period as Shadow Chancellor before I stood down, um, we submitted a range of papers to the government on how to deal with the COVID pandemic and its e in economic implications. And it was, uh, it was us, um, I submitted to Richard Soon at the Chancellor and, and had meetings with the civil servants and the cabinet office and the treasury. And it was us who put forward the furlough scheme as a minimum income guarantee effectively. And they, unfortunately, um, he introduced a scheme which didn't provide 100% protection for wages and also uh, excluded, well, the figures around 3 million people for many forms of support, which completely undermined the, the nature of the scheme 
that we were proposing, but at least there was some acceptance of the principle of furlough. So in some ways that's provided the argument for some form of minimum income guarantee upon which then it's only a small step towards a basic income. So I think to a certain extent, yeah, the debate is widened now. I don't want that to recede though, this campaign that's going on about building back better um, after the COVID crisis. Um, I, I don't want to go back at all. And actually some of the proposals I've seen is not better either. So I think what we, the debate that we're having now is what sort of society do we need uh, as we come through the pandemic crisis? And it has to be based on one of the fundamental lessons of the COVID pandemic, which is actually people want security. And part of that security is financial resilience. And that means having a basic income upon which people can have a decent quality of life. And, and from that, I think all sorts of other things emerge, particularly about once people have the security, how they can then develop their talents in such a way that they can develop it, not just themselves, but the whole of society. I think we're actually at a stage now where there's the potential of a huge paradigm shift. It's a bit like people keep on referring back to the Second World War and the Atlee government. And what they don't seem to have learned is that in the depths of the Second World War, the depths of the crisis, socialists and progressives and others came together and they looked back on the 1930s and said, never again will should we, our society experience those levels of insecurity and deprivation. And they started dreaming and then discussing and then planning the sort of society that they wanted after the Second World War. And that society was based upon a commitment to greater equality. It was based upon a commitment to full employment. And it was based upon a, a commitment to the provision of public services and a basic social security with regard to income. Now, that, that paradigm, if you like, held from up until the 1970s. And then there was another paradigm shift, which was the Thatcher, Thatcherite paradigm shift, which then introduced the concept of not collective pro provision or security, but actually individualism. And that individualism was then based upon almost a dog-eat-dog -dog neoliberal concept that the market is always right. That's how you value people. And also that then led to wholesale privatization. So the breaking down of collective provision of services into individual competition for resources. I think we're on the edge of another paradigm shift now. And the ways in which people have experienced 10 years of austerity, ill-prepared us then for the, dealing with the pandemic has meant people have a much more fundamental view of where we should go from here. And one of those areas, well, the, the sort of paradigm, the elements of that paradigm shift is actually is about people saying there should be a basic universal basic services, of course, and people should have a right to them. I think the way in which people should have a basic level of income, which will provide them with, again, a quality of life that people except as human beings should have a right to, but then also that we judge people not by their market value, but their social value. And the other paradigm shift is a shift from individualism to a sense of community. And then overriding all of that, obviously, is this issue of the next threat is climate change and the need to build in sustainability into everything that we do. So within that, you can see how actually people's ideas are shifting about the nature of the society that they want and an element of that, I think, is catered for by universal basic income. So all of a sudden, things that might have seen utopian 18 months, two years ago, are coming onto the agenda as practical and very pragmatic approaches to the way in which we change our society to meet the demand for change, for a different style, or a different type of life that we all want. So I'm quite optimistic we can win the argument. The issue then is securing a government that will then enable at least us to move to the next stage, which the, and I, at that stage uh, in, in the last general election, we were arguing for pilots. We might be in a situation then where we're whole, going for wholesale reform uh, after the next general election. But I'm hoping that we convince people across the political spectrum in a whole range of political parties that this is 
something that they can run with. And we might be on the edge of that. Some of the things that you raised there about, um, you know, you mentioned universal basic services, you mentioned the fact, uh, you know, you were talking at one point about the effectiveness, you know, how to implement these pilots in the most effective ways. And, and they're, they're some of the things that me and Sean talk about a lot is that, you know, universal basic income, one of its kind of, uh, one thing I think the, the proponents of basic income need to recognize on a more regular basis is that it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. It's, it, it shouldn't be touted as a, as a silver bullet. And I think uh, it, too often it is. And I think basic services, you know, recognizing that we need things like access to a decent education system, you know, transport links, all that kind of things. I think that is going to help strengthen the argument for a basic income. But one, of, you know, there is still skepticism. Um, we are definitely getting more attention for it and more people are being won over. But I think that there's still a few chinks in the armor with regards to just the some of the uh, the basic philosophies of uh, a basic income, uh, you know, for example, one of them, one of the most seen as the most utopian aspects of it is that it's available for everybody, no matter what their background, uh, you know, no matter what their uh, circumstance rather. Um, and I think that that might in the UK be a potential uh, drawback because, you know, it's an easy thing for, you know, an opposing political party to pick up everybody will agree that there's no point in having money building up in you know people's accounts that don't need it so if there's a way to make it easy to uh, mm. opt in and opt out like i think andrew yang mentions in his um uh, freedom dividend for the us uh, his his version of ubi uh, would that be something that you'd be in support of kind of I'm really rearranging wary. i understand the argument i'm a bit wary about it that's all because i believe yeah. in universality and I take you back to, to my youth, really. Uh, when I was a young political activist working in the trade union movement, um, we had the argument over child benefit. And we were saying, well, our argument then was that we, it was all about tackling child poverty. And so therefore, uh, how do we do that in the best way? And you know, means-tested benefits were there and they weren't working, simple as that. And not just they weren't working, they weren't getting to the people who needed it, but also they're incredibly expensive to administer. So we ran a campaign and actually Child Poverty Action Group um, were at the forefront of it, but actually behind Child Poverty Action Group was a hell of a lot of work going on for the TUC, the Trade Union Congress, and a lot of trade unions arguing for it. And we had to win the argument, our universality of that child benefit. So that child benefit should go to everyone because it's the mm. best way in which to actually get the resources where it's needed. At the same time, it was cheaper to administer but actually also, once you included everyone, everyone defended it, you know, and so, right. and that crudely as well, you know, we have to, the crude politics is this as well, is if you recruited a large numbers of largely middle-class people in, into the, the argument that the need for child benefit and they received it themselves, it actually became easier to defend and that you had then the, the vast bulk of the population benefiting from it and as a result of that defending it and it's been very difficult um, for subsequent governments to scrap child benefit they've frozen it to undermine it under the tories but actually it's been impossible for them to scrap it because you've got that breadth of support so once you get that buy-in for everyone, everyone is benefiting from it it becomes that much easier to defend then because you've got the bulk of population on your side but again I, just going back to the point you raised about um, universal basic services, some people seem to have ar be arguing, and this is classic on the progressive side of politics, if you like, is that if we can find something to argue and dispute and to split over, we will do. The issue around universal basic services, universal basic incomes, that they go hand in hand. That's yeah. the whole point. And I think the paradigm shift that we're looking for at the moment is that actually people look at society and thinking, what do people need to have a decent quality of life? So it's about having a roof over your head, so the right yeah. to house it. It's about making sure you have a decent income at uh, work if you can get it, so a jobs guarantee, simple as that. Yeah. And then if you look at what people want in terms of living in a decent environment, they want a clean environment, et cetera, so you have a right to be able to breathe fresh air, the right to be able to live in, 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 in a relatively again clean environment all of that but also there's this issue about the right to 
to be able to well, just survive, have sufficient income to be able to put the food on the plate for your children, to actually just have sufficient income to have a, a decent quality of life. So actually that all comes together, I think, in this paradigm change, which is about what do we need in you know, the fifth largest economy in the world? What do we need to ensure that everyone has a decent quality of life? The other thing as well is that what the pandemic is, what the pandemic has drawn out is actually we do care for one another. We and also we need one another. Mm. So again, when people are looking round and they're thinking, well, the way we value people at the moment is on the basis of what they can obtain in the market. But actually, it's more important to have a social value. So those carers that are paid so little and disrespected at the moment are the ones actually much more significant than someone speculating in the city at the moment. Yeah, so again, yeah, yeah. That, that's led to, well, how can we make sure they, they are all treated fairly? Well, one way of doing that is to have a basic income so everyone has a decent quality of life. So I think the argument is, is shifting on. But I want, I want to stick with universalism I, I, because in that way, you're building a societal approach. Yeah. You're building the bonds of security between one another and bonds of solidarity. Well, no, to be fair, as, a, as with any political ideal, um, it, it, it can be divisive. And I think with basic income, it's the symbolism behind it rather than the actual kind of details of implementation, which is quite divisive. And I, I know it's kind of a, a, a pat thing to say, but, you know, politics is downstream from philosophy and ultimately your, um, your sensibilities towards society and humanity colours and uh, informs your, your, political, your political bent, your political stance. And I just think that basic income, that's where the, that's where the, the real hurdle is for UBI, P, PR to jump over, is convincing largely, I would say, the working class that this isn't some wishy-washy snowflake yeah. progressivism. Yeah. So yeah. how do we do that? Well, we did it. See, what's interesting, we did it after the Second World War um, by way of... Um, everyone understanding, and it was the experience of the 30s, basically, that you know, levels of poverty, people were not willing to put up with those levels of poverty and deprivation anymore. So therefore, after the Second World, we introduced a social security system that largely mm. people had buying for. They did it on the insurance principle, you know, that, that was in some ways, it was a fig, the insurance principle was always a bit of a fig leaf of cover, ideologically, you know, you pay in, and then you get out. But there was always within that system a recognition that not everyone's going to pay in. There's lots of people who are either going to be either too sick or disabled or whatever, or still low, unemployed, unable to get a job, who, you know, not able to buy in. So in some ways, the insurance principle covered that period. Now I think we're at that stage where people recognise actually the, our society is pretty rich. You know, we have got an abundance, if you like, but it is yeah. about the distribution of that wealth and income that we need to tackle. And therefore, yeah. it is a matter of saying, actually, we want everyone to have a decent quality of life. And if we redistributed what the wealth and the income that is available to us, we could enable that to happen. And we should set a, we should set a basic level in which people can have that decent quality of life, and that requires a decent level of income. The argument that always comes forward is, you know, if people, uh, people, uh, it's almost this deserving or undeserving poor argument that gets this hangover from from the poor law. I think we've, I think there's a potential of moving beyond that because of this issue around people don't want to live in a society where there's these grotesque levels of inequality, and people will understand more and more the uh, the consequences of that, and in particular the failure to really value one another as we have done within this sort of neoliberal market system that we've got. Yeah, well, you know what? I think you made a really good point um, towards, uh, you know, the universality argument because everybody treasures the NHS. Like, you know, it's a national uh, point of pride. And I think uh, it is a really good point that you made that if we get everybody involved, then they're more likely to defend it. Um, and that, you know, you touched upon um the fact that we are now aware because of the pandemic just how deep the, the kind of pockets are for the country even though um one thing i did think is that 
maybe uh, opposition, you know, other people uh, against basic income might pick up the fact that we're in, uh, you know, a state of debt. Uh, where after the pandemic, they might use that as an excuse to why we can't afford such a scheme or, you know, just you can imagine there's all sorts of um, arguments that they could bring up against basic income after all, all, all this kind of term or the economy has gone through. And I just want to know, like, what do you think it is that we need to do in order to convince people that actually this is something that's going to help the economy because you know people have money in their pockets it's going to stimulate yeah. things but what, what, how, how do we convince people that this is actually something they deserve like because it seems to be that people are setting this nowadays this kind of out, out for yourself mentality yeah the whole issue about debt has been one of the arguments that they've used to ensure to implement austerity measures for the last 11 years you know the country can't afford it we've got to balance the books all this analogy of the household budget that they've used to, to demonstrate um, that somehow you have to cut back on public services rather than invest in the economy. I think that argument is largely blown now because actually when COVID came along and the pandemic it hit, there was no shortage of resources to be mm. found, you know, and money was created. You know, we had quantitative easing on another massive scale just to get by. I think the issue around debt itself is... Our argument has always been, and we've argued it in, in recent years, basically, that you have to take, in a trading country like ours, of course, you have to take debt into account. You have to take the implications it has for the pound, the currency, that sort of thing. But you do it in a way which enables you to ensure that you plan the economy in the longer term. And I think mm -hmm. the, the, the old idea that the Tories themselves stole but never actually implemented of having a long-term economic plan is what people will understand. And part of that is, is yes, a, a country will borrow and it will borrow at cheap interest rates and it will invest and it will grow the economy. And on that basis, you'll be able to ensure that you can afford the levels of expenditure that you need rather than public services or on a basic income. But the key element around basic income is that if there's any issue that we have to confront in this coming period is to make sure that we have sufficient demand within the economy to ensure that we have the demand capable of ensuring that people have a job to go to as they, we come out of the pandemic. And a lot of those jobs we know will be around um, ta uh, the Green New Deal, making sure that we can tackle climate change. Of course we do that. But it will still need that we need to unleash demand in the economy. And the way that you do that is to make sure that people have money in their pockets. And they're the sort of people who will spend it as well rather than hoard it. Mm. And that's what basic income will do. It will then ensure yeah. that people have the inc sufficient income to give them a decent quality of life, and that money will then flow to the economy. In fact, it's the sort of financial stimulus that we could desperately need with to stimulate the economy as we come out of the pandemic, and as we have the overhang tail, tragically, of the scale of joblessness that we've seen. So what are your, yeah. uh, what are your forecasts then when it comes to, to timeframes? I'm curious to learn uh, when you think there'll be any meaningful nationwide legislation, right. when, there'll be a, when there'll be a build out of kind of like prodigious um, basic income pilots, you know, upwards of like half a million participants. Yeah. I, would, I would say uh, this, is the, uh, this is a tragedy for me, really. If we'd, have, um, if we'd have got into government way back in 2019, we would have had pilots running for the first couple of years, having then, um, desert, I think then combination of having hind out any difficulties and then convince people that they were workable, we would have then spent the next two years rolling out nationally. I saw in the lifetime of one parliament, so a sort of four to five year parliamentary cycle. The reality is now we've got to continue to win the argument and use, and use the, the next 18 months to two years in trying to get basic income into the common political debate. I think that's happening. Try and convince a coalition of political parties. The reality is most probably it's Labour and the Lib Dems Greens mm -hmm. and others to see whether or not we can get uh, those political parties and their activist base to coalesce around basic income. And on that basis, who, if we can get a, it would have to be a Labour majority government, I think, to be able to drive this through at the next general election. We stand, I think, we stand a realistic chance within the next decade of having basic income rolled out. Um, for me, as a Labour MP, the issue is making sure the Labour Party adheres to the policy that we had previously. I think there's a fair amount of support in that. 
the, sec the Shadow Secretary of State for um, Department of Work and Pensions, Johnny Reynolds, was in my Treasury team, and he has been an ardent advocate of basic income for well, a large number of years. So I think there's some key, L key people on the Labour Party front bench that will run with this. And I think within the party overall, the, I think there's a majority position now in terms of basic income, and at least, I think an overwhelming majority, at least for the, those pilots. At the local level, what I think was really interesting is where we've got elected mayors, most of the elected mayors, Labour elected mayors are advocates of basic income. And as I said before, when I was the shadow um, chancellor, we had um, Labour local authorities bidding to be the first in the range of pilots themselves. The Lib Dems now, I think, are fairly convinced around basic income. I don't think there's been any shift back from them. The Greens themselves, and I think also we now have quite a large number of civil society organisations outside the political parties who are uh, advocating or committed to at least the piloting of basic income so we can move it forward. What we've got to do, and I think there is a limited period of time, it is the 18 months to two years, but because after that we'll be virtually into a general election campaign, uh, what, what we've got to do is build up an unstoppable climate of opinion so that we can then, um, whoever's in government, realise this is an issue that's got to be addressed. But this is the thing, yeah. why, do you think, uh, why do you think the right haven't, I'm just speaking broadly now, why do you think the right haven't embraced it, perhaps as well, warmly as the left? Because, I mean, as Rutger Bregman said, it would be the crowning achievement of capitalism, effectively. Well, some elements on the right obviously are advocating it, but they're advocating it for their own specific purposes. And to a certain extent, there's an element of scepticism about what their motivations are, um, particularly with regard to um, undermining the basics of the welfare state that we've created so far. But I don't, there seems to be, uh, there seems to be a dead hand of um, ideological debate within the Conservative Party in this country at the moment anyway. Um, so it's very difficult to see many Tory MPs or other Tory advocates coming onto, onto the basic income side. But we'll see. I think, it's, I think it's like any of these issues really. And I go back to child benefit. It was one of those ideas that was quite um, unique, seen as utopian, seen as unrealistic. And it's one of those classic things that Tony Benn used to say, isn't it? When you come forward with an idea like this, you'll be condemned, you'll be marginalised, it'll be seen as a lunatic idea. Within a limited period of time, there'll be a lot of people then who are advocating that they first thought of it, you know? And I mm. think that's where we're on. We're close to that on this. People are beginning to be convinced by basic income who were uh, ardent opponents previously and are trying to claim it for the future one. Fair enough. Well, Guy Standin in our documentary makes, uh, I think he quotes uh, uh, a situation with Theodore Roosevelt, is it, Sean? Mm -hmm. uh, where he was, uh, he was told about basic income and he said uh, to the person proposing it to him, uh, you've convinced me, now go and make me do it. And I think that is largely the, this is why we introduced the Vox Pops into the documentary, because, you know, just from general conversations, from a bit of research we did, and, you know, on the back of the elections, uh, you know, the back of things like Brexit, you saw that the biggest the biggest area where it can't, ideas like this kind of falls down is, is in the mind of the public, in the mind and the heart of, of the public. And I think people who are proposing a basic income too often forget that and kind of dismiss, uh, you know, just think people are going to take it on because it's such a, a, a universal idea. Everybody benefits from it, but it's just not the case. And I think there's a lot of work to be done in convincing the public still uh, in the UK. Especially. There is, yeah, there is, but I just put this to you really, is that the COVID pandemic has meant that many more people than before are now experiencing the social security system as it now exists and realizing just how limited it is in providing people with any form of protection or security. And mm. I just give the example of the number of people who are now in self-employment, small and medium enterprises, who as a result of the COVID pandemic have lost all support whatsoever and are being forced back onto universal credit. And are realizing just how little that is. It's, you, know, you cannot live off universal credit, full stop. So uh, 
for the first time in quite a while, you have large numbers of people who have had, up until now, very little dealings with the social security system and are now realizing it doesn't work and actually yeah. are now looking for something different. And that opens up the opportunity then of convincing them that there has to be something different, but it has to give people security. Now, we have a social security system that doesn't give people security. We've got to provide a system that does. That's why they're open up to new ideas. And of course, you have to cut through some of the, the ideological debris hangover, even, as I say, right back to the poor law days of deserving and undeserving poor, all those to, those uh, ideological oppressive uh, measures that were introduced. But I think we can do that because I think there's a new world shaping up now. And uh, Guy, oh, Guy, and, uh, Guy and others, whereas in the past, have seen as uh, or, you know, on the edge, on the fringe or whatever, it's interesting just how many people like Guy and others now are being in invited into you know, discussion groups and chambers and rooms, et cetera, and organizations that wouldn't touch this idea with a barge pole years ago. But now people like Guy are being invited in to explain what it actually is and what the implications of it. Well, it could be that this kind of uh, this ideological back and forth, uh, it, it may just be irrelevant. I mean, what do you think of the idea that basic income could simply be born out of necessity because of the, uh, the imminent wave of automation uh, misemployment, job obsolescence. Uh, sure, I mean, it would, a, it would just happen as a result of that, right? Yeah, I think there's there's a whole there's a coalition of factors coming together that have put basic income on the agenda. Mm. Um, and the the tragedy of COVID certainly, I think, has been influential in opening up new doors for people to have that discussion. There's an increasingly acknowledgement of um, the, the way in which our economy is developing as a basis of, uh, well, the development of new technology, artificial intelligence, of course, and automation. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate, though, the ability of that simply to be used to a greater exploitation than actually freeing people up. And so uh, there's an acknowledgement of that now. So that does lead on to people now saying, well, actually, um, if there is greater automation, we're using artificial intelligence more. Why aren't we reducing the working hours? Why aren't we going for a four-day week, etc.? Mm -hmm. And linked to that is also saying, well, if we are moving in that, that direction of less work or less hours, therefore, how do we secure our, our basic level of income, which will give us a decent quality of life? That's where there's a whole range of discussions taking place about what should be the a minimum income guarantee, what sort of rights should people have to access that income, and therefore basic income comes on the agenda there as well. So in a period of change like this, there's real opportunities to shift the argument along and, and win the argument. Do you, do you think uh, it will be easier to, um, you know, uh, with regards to paying for this and, um, you know, figuring out ways to, uh, support the financial side of you know the financial cost of a basic income do you think it'll be easier to uh, implement taxes on certain companies like tech companies that are uh, you know responsible for taking so much uh, uh, so much out of society like you know amazon the fact that they're growing so big now as as one example they um you know the, 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 there's shops that don't exist anymore that otherwise would have existed so they're taking a lot out of out of society how do we put enough pressure on people to get uh you know the tax that's deserved from them all i can say is that in the discussions that are taking place now more broadly about the distribution of wealth and income within our own society in the uk it's quite remarkable that the discussion around using the tax system for redistribution has dramatically changed over the last 12 months as a result of COVID. We now have a Conservative Chancellor who is floating ideas around increasing corporation tax in this coming period. Um, and again, a policy that was advocated by Labour and roundly mm. condemned during the last general election has come back onto the agenda because there's a recognition that you have to have some element of redistribution 
if if we're going to have a society in which people can get by, some of them can survive. Um, this, in this recent period, we've just had uh, surveys undertaken which have demonstrated that not only have we got large numbers of people in severe poverty, we've got large numbers of people in severe debt, and we've actually had a doubling of the people who are described as living in destitution, a doubling of it. And the expression destitution is, has been rarely used in the UK, but it's suddenly has come back on the agenda. So there's a real, I think there's a real debate going on about inequality, the distribution of wealth and income, and therefore what we do about it. And that's even penetrated the Tory party. It's quite remarkable, really. Mm. So in that sense, there's, again, there's a shaking up of the ideas around how you ensure that you tackle inequalities, how you use the tax system more progressively, and then how then uh, building into a progressive tax system, the best mechanism of redistribution and basic income is one of the best me mechanisms to do that because it means that everyone will have that security for the future and everyone in that sense um, can contribute as well as gain from it as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly an idea that would uh, maximize uh, equal opportunity. I mean, that's uh, surely everybody uh, wants that. Um, well, we've even had a discussion recently, haven't we, a debates um, around on taxation, around windfall taxes. And mm -hmm. the, yeah. win uh, the windfall taxes that have been suggested have been, as, uh, this is quite traditional as well, way back in 1951, Rab Butler, a Conservative Chancellor, actually had windfall taxes on the armaments companies that were making what he considered excess profits in rearming for the Korean War. It's quite remarkable. And Gordon Brown introduced a windfall tax in 97, 98 on those companies, energy companies in particular, who made ex what was considered excess profits. So there's a debate going on now about the potential for windfall taxes on those who've actually had significant, gained significant profits in the COVID pandemic. So the banks mm -hmm. um, that, are more, uh, that issue mortgages, um, the property developers, the landlords, and then on the tech companies, but also the other element of that as well as those who've received um, contracts from government and uh, have excess profits in relation to COVID provisions. So the whole tax debate now is moving is moving on remarkably. As I say, only you know December 19, uh, we were being condemned simply for putting forward a proposal for in, uh, restoring some of the income tax cuts that had been taken place. And now it's all on the agenda from a Tory government. Do you think something, you know, we talk about universal basic services. Do you think housing needs to be a part of that discussion? Because there is a, obviously the risk that what, if we manage to implement a, a basic income that, you know, private landlords can essentially implement that private tax or increase that private tax on people, knowing that they have this. Yeah. If you look at the, the concept of marrying universal basic services, with basic income. If you look at those universal basic services that people need, that it's about making sure people have a right to a home and a decent roof over their heads, a right to health at the NHS, a right to social care, which is privatized mm. at the moment. And again, no, uh, had severe cutbacks under austerity, about 8 billion cut from social care in the UK. And then it, there's even now the discussion around the right to food. Now, one of those ways in which you, all of those, you combine then those with a basic income, that means the level of basic income needs to reflect the level of free access to basic services as well. You can yeah. see how you can combine it all The other issue which we put on the agenda was this issue around connectivity. So broadband, free universal broadband, um, that again enables people to... Uh, have a connection with the external world, but also is valuable in terms of employment as well as education. So the whole range of issues now is up, up in the air for that sort of debate, of which basic income is an element. On broadband, it's quite remarkable. You know, in December 19, when we launched the policy about free universal broadband, it was described as broadband communism. Now people are clamouring for some form mm. of universal um, service with regard to broadband. So. The whole debate, I think the whole climate of the debate has changed dramatically. And you can see 
how each individual element now is beginning to fit together. My argument is that it's trying to give people sort of guarantees in life. You know, you guarantee that they will have access to a job or education. You guarantee that they will have a decent home, but that on the decent own home issue, the campaigning that's been done at the moment from the renters union and from a group in the UK called ACORN is about making sure that actually there are rent controls so that the rents reflect the income of, uh, that people have in a particular area. Again, that's not revolutionary. That used to happen. We used to have fair rents in this country and there were rent controls and there are rent controls in cities across Europe. Secondly, now that's thrown open the whole debate about landlordism and why should, um, why should corporations own properties and make vast profits from them? Should we limit the number of homes that people should own? So in that way, you abolish mm. landlordism. And the interesting thing is that when the Labour Party was first founded and Keir, Keir Hardy was its leader, um, he stood on a platform of, his, of socialism and the abolition of landlordism. So the whole concept of landlordism has now been opened up in this debate by those campaigning to make sure that people have a decent roof over their heads. I think, again, you can see you, housing becomes a universal basic service that people have a, a right to being part of the future debate. And that then opens up the demand for rent controls, the scrapping of corporations um, uh, profiteering from housing and the limitation on the number of properties an individual can own to profit from. Yeah, I think it's, it's these issues that you're talking about. I think that's why I prefer um, a citizen uh, stipend or a social dividend. I prefer those terms more than a yeah, life yeah. Or something. But uh, just yeah. before we run out of time, I want to ask you, um, do you have any uh, criticisms or misgivings about basic income? I mean, do you think that it's gearing us into techno-feudalism or rather could gear us into, you know what I mean? Like, do you have any doubts about it at all? No, I think we can manage the, I think we could, that's why I'm interested in the pilots. There's two issues here, making sure that we establish a system in which the various range of reforms that we want are alongside universal basic services, basic income, as well as, if you like, a civil liberties approach to a number of these issues where people are basing their access to these services and that income as of right. So therefore, how you change the constitution to ensure that people have those rights embedded in law and in law that's enforceable. I think there's a package there that we need to hone down now. And the best way of doing that is looking to see how we pilot that and then introduce it as a, as a national program. That, that's the issue for me. The, the big issue is the ones that you're focused on is how do we convince people of this? And you're right, to a certain extent, it's the use of language. In, in politics, there's different ways about how you approach these campaigns. Some politicians who, uh, uh, I suppose, weather veins really, will go along and use focus groups to say, you know, what do we need to say to get elected in that way? The other thing is, is if you're not a weather vein, but actually you're a signposter, what you do is you go along to those focus groups, and say, this is what we want to do. What are the best, what's the best, how can we convince you about how, that, how important this is? And then that way you test the language, et cetera. Part of the work we've got to do now is that testing of how we get these ideas across in a way that will maximize support. And I think that's the, some of the work that a number of us need to do more effectively at the moment. And in that way, we can convince people about the importance of them. But the, the climate after, in this, in the UK, after 11 years of austerity, grinding austerity, pay freezes, cutbacks in public services, the expansion of food banks, the, the levels of not just poverty, but now this concept of destitution, and then the COVID pandemic hitting us hard, explaining to people just how much we need one another, how much we need a decent if you like, bases a foundation in which to have a decent quality of life. That's opened up the, I think that's opened up in some ways tragically because of COVID, that's opened up the opportunity now of quite radical change. So uh, we've yeah. got to seize the moment and that moment, I think of winning the argument is the next two years. And then after that, if we can get a progressive government, then it's that five year period afterwards of implementation. 
That's why I'm saying this next decade, I think, is absolutely critical when it comes to the campaigning for basic income and its rollout. One of the things I think, once you've, once you've rolled it out in one major, I think, once you've rolled it out in one major economy, I think it then becomes infectious. Others will be demanding it immediately. Yeah, I'm likely to agree. If, 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 if a place like the UK uh, adopts such a policy, I think you start to see the benefits fairly quickly just because of how fast I think it will have an impact on, on, on society uh, over here. And I think, yeah, you will gain support in, in other areas. I'd agree with you. Yeah, uh, I think the key thing I, as well is that there needs to be more, much more uh, nuance in the debate. Um, because I, th I do think nuance lends itself to credibility of an idea and um, yeah. it's certainly a way that, that can, it can be a bit more of a cooperative uh, idea. Yeah, and I think I always, I always say to people, the test is uh, the 10 past eight test on the BBC's Today programme. If you, uh, 10 past eight is when you have the main grilling of a politician around a mm. particular issue or policy. And so the test is, can you answer all those questions that are thrown at you at 10 past eight on the Today programme and walk away thinking, yeah, you can, and you've convinced them. And I think we've got to move to that stage now in which every question around basic income is thrown at us, we can respond. That's why for me, the importance of getting a few pilots done to hammer out the practice is yeah, so important yeah. because in that way, you just get to that situation where no matter what argument is thrown at you, you can say, well, we've tested that and this worked, tested that, this didn't, that's why we went. Yeah, to this because if someone was a kind of robust skeptic of the idea, even just symbolically, at least then with more pilots, there'd be more data and you yeah. can kind of show them. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and see the work that Guy's done in particular and others in other economies, you can point to but it isn't as convincing as something done within your own backyard or within your own economy. And that's why I think, I think Sheffield and Liverpool, other areas like that, where you've had historic um, change because of what's been happening to their economies over the last 40 years, are key areas where you can then deal with these issues of um, poverty and deprivation within those cities. But you know also that there's, there's a potential in those cities, for quite vibrant economies for the future, that basic income would actually contribute to as well. So yeah, I think the way forward now is uh, the advocacy of the argument, the winning across the political spectrum of support, at least to move towards the pilot stage, then a government yeah. that then runs those pilots that we can hammer out um, the, the best system that we roll out nationally. Uh, yeah, I think pilots are going to be a, a huge. Is it is is it a case that you need to be um, in power to implement those pilots? Is are the charities or foundations uh, around at the moment yeah, that you guys are working with? To be honest, I think in, for the pilots themselves, it needs national government, and it needs the resources from national government. And I, I can't see any other way of doing it. Um, you can local authorities on their own can lay the grounding. For the arguments for it and they can do research and detailed consultation and i think that's one way of preparing the ground but when it comes to implementation it needs central government support because you're impact you're impacting on a national system of social security and taxation as well is there any uh, and just before we round up is there any uh, kind of uh, possibility do you think of a cross-party agreement on pilots just to see i Anything can happen at the moment. Literally yeah. anything can happen. If you'd have asked me that question you know, 18 months ago, I said there was no chance whatsoever. I yeah. think there's such shifting sands you know, that are happening and things are happening so rapidly as well. So yeah, I think, I think it's quite interesting. I can't see a conservative government doing it, but I can see sufficient support on a cross-party basis, including some Tories, that it does become a, a reality for um, a progressive government, definitely. Yeah, and I can't, I could see a build up of parliamentary support within on a cross party basis over this coming periods. And if I'd have said that a short while ago, it would have seen, been seen as absolutely utopian idealism. I think that's mm -hmm. dramatically changed now. We're in a new world, partly because of COVID, and but also I actually think as well, partly because of the 
11 years of austerity and the exhaustion from that as well. And therefore people looking for alternatives, definitely. Yeah, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up there. As I mentioned, I'm a, okay. I'm a skin right. flint and I only have Zoom basic and there's restrictions on this. So, <laughs> so, um, well, that's yeah. a good discipline to have, isn't it really? <laughs> yes, that's so. Universal um, basic Zoom is too idealistic a problem. <laughs> Thank All you very right. much for today. I Josh. hope that yeah. helps. It was a bit rambling from me, I'm afraid, but I hope that helps anyway. Okay. I really appreciate your time, John. Thanks very much. Keep in touch as well, will you? Let me know how it goes on. Yeah, yeah we, we will. will. Thank, Thank you. you. All the best. Cheers. If they can find the money, yes, it is a good idea. And I quite agree with it. We've seen some extraordinary reports, not just from within the UK, but also from without, including the United Nations, showing that the poorest people in this society are now extremely poor. This is an extraordinary indictment of one of the richest nations on earth. You could argue that food banks are themselves a symptom of a broken society. The welfare system we have isn't working very well, and, and yet it's still costing all this money. Today we have the highest employment rates we've ever had in the UK. More people are in work than ever before. But the fact is that more people who are in work are in poverty than ever before. A basic income would help to solve these problems much better than the current social security system. A basic income would be a payment made to every individual paid unconditionally. It would be paid as a regular amount. It would be a modest amount, and a critical part of it is that it's non-withdrawable. When they say, where do we get the money for UBI, the first thing I always say is, well, where do they get the money for quantitative easing? The problem with UBI is that the basic levels of benefits are often not dealt with. So it's not just the affordability that uh, is the issue with, with UBI. I think it's too good to be true. To be honest, I don't think they're going to get it from anywhere, especially to pay everyone in the country the same amount of money every, every month.